So it's uh, 2016, um, a year at Flora here. We've uh, eventually come out of winter for what winter we've had. Crops are looking okay. We've struggled with our late drilling at the end, the end of 2015, that we've uh, struggled with a few slug, slug issues, uh, as well as um, some wet patches as ever. Um, but generally the farm looks okay, and hopefully in a few months time we'll look a lot better. Um, we've got a lot going on. We've got some spring crops to plant. We've got some spring barley and obviously a large chunk of maize to, to plant. And of course, we'll go flying straight into, uh, into rye harvest um, f and then straight all the way through to the cereal harvest into maize. Throughout that part of the year, there will also be a lot of cultivations, a lot of drilling, uh, a lot of crop spray and a lot of fertilizer, plus anything else which sort of pops up on the way. We are looking forward to it. It's going to be a big year for us. The, uh, the big change for us this year will hopefully be that AD will happen. We've been battling away with AD as far as planning goes for nigh on four years so far, uh, but we're getting close. We hope that by the end of the year we will be at least in build in one, if not in two AD plants. Uh, and that's a, a game changer for us here at Flaubra. Uh, it will allow us to grow a lot more crops which are We'll give our landowners a lot more crops, um, which are more profitable. They're more, they're getting more choice. They're going to be able to use their, um, use a lot more manures. Well, they'll, they'll spend less money on fertilizer, allowing them to use more manures based, backed out of the AD plant. Um, and hopefully be at the end of it more profitable. They are very, very supportive. They've been there, st stood by us for a long time. They can see the benefits from it, from the crops we've grown already. Um, the AD crops also bring a lot to the party when it comes to black grass control, which is probably our single biggest problem we can suffer here at Flaubra. We are hoping by able to by be able to grow AD crops that we will be on top of our black grass to the point that we're not having to worry about it as intensively as we are doing at the moment. So therefore allowing us to perhaps drill slightly earlier than we're having to drill at the moment for our cereal crops, which are the, probably the crops we struggle the most. Of. Well, we're a, um, here at Flora, we're, we're a traditional family farm, sort of in the core here at the middle, which is roughly uh, 400 hectares one way or the other. And then we're farming um, an another sort of 16, 1700 hectares on contract farm arrangements within a sort of five, six mile radius of where we are, so pretty much next door. Um, so we're 2000 hectares of combinable crops we're also then doing on to, uh, sort of within that and on top of that uh, some AD work. So the Flora Farms sort of group of farmers are growing um, this year roughly 500 hectares of maize uh, and 300 hectares of hybrid rye. Um, I hope when AD sort of happens and we get to full spec that we'll be probably doing closer to 1,000 hectares to, to, to 1,200 hectares of maize. Um, grown by ourselves and our surrounding neighbours and then also um, sort of five six hundred hectares of hybrid rye. That's a sort of a minimum where we're aiming to. We're hoping that that will obviously down the line increase a lot more when we um, we can offer some more contracting services out towards other AD plants. We have, uh, we, well, we're only sort of, um, we have for our combinable crops uh, roughly um, 14 or 1300, 1200 hectares to harvest this, this year, which for us is actually the least amount we've harvested for a long time. Traditionally, we would try and put 2000 hectares um, through one combine, which would be a struggle in some years, but generally we would, we would manage. Um, so the combining actually for us is slightly more relaxed as it used to be because we're now spreading our workload. Not only are we spreading our workload though, but we're now working where we used to be busy for eight weeks of the year in summer, we're now busy for 12, 16, 18 weeks of the year now. So we, um, we're, uh, it's gonna be an interesting year for us having Dave here sort of following us throughout the season. We've known Dave for a few years now. Dave's uh, was uh, t had taken some photos of the farm when he first started sort of f filming tractors and then agricultural machinery back in the day. Um, but we were sort of quite flattered when he asked whether we would be interested in having him here following us for a year so and jumped at the chance to be honest we've, we've got quite a pre, uh, quite a presence in social media uh, and we do quite a lot sort of on our Facebook page and on Twitter so it was a natural step for us to sort of go the next stage and be be part of this um, 
why why so a lot of people have well not a lot of people but a few people have mentioned you know why would you want someone following you all the time doing following your successes and failures throughout the year for me i think it's an important thing to to share what's going on here at Flora with people who are interested and wanting to know um i hope that it won't purely just be for the 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 uh, people who appreciate agricultural machinery i hope it's for the uh the, the technically minded as well as the young and sort of keen people who are wanting to join the industry and look into the industry as well as sort of hopefully being an ambassador for the industry so that the general public get a bit more understanding perhaps on what we're doing and we're not all uh, that, we're, that we're not all sort of awkward people holding them upon the road or causing issues around their houses it's purely you know it, i want them to learn as much as anyone else does about what we do as an arable industry why we do it uh, I'd also like people to understand why we've moved into wanting to be involved with anaerobic digesters. They get a pretty tough time um, in the, well, the, the industry give them a tough time and the general public give them a tough time. Um, I actually think if they're done properly, uh, they're a wonderful thing. They're, they're, it isn't all about having hundreds of thousands of acres of maize dotted around the place causing issues on the road. For me, I want to be the person who proves that wrong, that you can grow it sustainably, grow it profitably grow it without causing any issues for anyone else around uh, the general public, whoever it might be, other farmers. It's, uh, I want to be the person who proves that wrong because there are an awful, awful amount of people who are making a bad job of, of AD uh, and giving the whole industry a bad name. So we've been doing our um, second, second application of liquid nitrogen today uh, on the oilseed rape and hybrid rye. Um, hybrid dry this morning. Hybrid dry all applied um, obviously with the horse sprayers and backed up with the, uh, with the Unimog Bowser um, using N35 plus S so that's 35% nitrogen as a liquid. using the end tester to take a reference point for what it tells me the, uh, the greenness or the, the nitrogen in the crop is at this point in time and all we use it for is to look in two or three weeks time to see whether it's gone up or going down and then we'll know whether we've fertilized it enough or underdone it if you like so all you do is you um, calibrate it which is just as we're doing that and then you have to go and sit down here and do 50 clicks on the last two leaf out on a dry crop. Dodge at the wall. So 589, that's the lowest I've done on the ride this spring. So what should it be? What's the... I know what it is. I'm using it as a reference for now. By the end of the season it should be up to 700. Uh, we had a, uh, we put chicken, the reason we started using it this spring is we put some chicken muck on the last autumn before a crop of rye. We're not quite sure what what we should be taking as the amount of nitrogen from that chicken muck because there's so many different act available nitrogen because there's so many different sort of ideas. And so I've just been using this to see whether that'll tell me whether it's chicken muck still giving away its nitrogen to the crop because it'll keep on rising, whether we need to put any more fertilizer or not. 
do a lot of farmers use this process or is this quite yeah. cutting edge? I think, and... I think a lot of people use it towards the end of the season for, to, uh, to know whether you've fed your crop enough and to know whether you've got enough enough of nitrogen in the crop that, uh, and the flag leaf to sort of to get you through to get a decent protein. It's, it's used for that really, that's what it came out for. And originally they came out, every time you use the end, test, end sensor in the field, you have to go out and do a scan of the field and then uh, feed that into the into your end sensor. But that now is sort of self-calibrated, it knows what it's doing. So from that point of view, it's not necessary. Yeah, okay, so we're in the, um, we're in the Mercedes Unimob. Obviously there's not many of these uh, in ag really. Uh, we've had Unimog since 19, well, I was, yeah, mid 70s I guess. So the old man bought the first one mid 70s, it had a sprayer mounted on the back and then also did a lot of the cultivation, a lot of the drilling. Uh, the big thing about them I suppose then was compared to as they are now, you're comparing a Unimog which hasn't changed dramatically in the principles of itself uh, compared to like a Massey 590 tractor. So back in the day a Unimog in a, in a field doing draft work, cultivation work was every bit as good as a, as a standard tractor was at the time, whereas now Unimog in the field pretty average to be honest because they haven't really changed, they've got little wheels on them so they're, they're, they're not a cultivation machine, they're not a, um, not a drilling machine but what they are excellent at is logistics and haulage and that's what we use one for so you know they won't pull a skin off a rice pudding in a field but for, for what we're doing and what we use it for with the mounted tank on the back for remixing for, uh, for the bows and oh yeah, for the sprayers for um, fertiliser and, and uh, spraying. Uh, it's cracking, it's great. And then also we've now done the same principle to do um, to do seed for the drill. So that's we're in the yard. We're trying to build it at the moment. I'm not getting on very well with hydraulic issues, but we're we'll get there. And that's getting so it's one shot. So rather than having a big trailer with the with all your seeds sat on top and your liquid fertilizer sat on the front, we're uh, we're just going to fill the fill the Unimog and the hopper and the little liquid tanks up at the yard. And, Trot off to the drill and fill the drill up wherever the drill wants filling. Take the seed to the drill rather than taking the uh, taking the um, drill to the seed. So we've got 5,000 litres on the back here. Uh, we hold um, four and a half thousand litres in the main tank, 500 litres in the clean water tank. Uh, the sprayers are obviously a lot bigger; they're 8,000 litres. But the beauty of being 8,000 litres is obviously you don't have to fill them. But more importantly, when we look after both sprayers with one Unimog, we can sit there and fill. Uh, we can always turn up with the Unimog and empty into the sprayers because even if he's got some left in, we've got some capacity in there to be able to take a full load which allows the Unimog to then trot back and fill up with whatever he's filling up with to go and fill up the next spray. So it makes a big difference. I, I mean, the big one for me output, if we're spraying, so we're doing complicated tank mix and we're spraying at uh, 100 litres a hectare, um, but it's taking you sort of 40 minutes to fill that sort of 50 hectare tank tank up or that to mix the mix as such. Um, the Unimog will allow us to spray 100 hectares a day more with just one sprayer, so more with two sprayers. So it makes a big, big difference in output, particularly uh, particularly in the spring and long days, complicated mixes. Liquid fertilizer again, output will be phenomenal because you're just spending time putting fertilizer on rather than having to spend time filling it up. We were losing an hour a day. Before we were doing the pre-mix principle of the Unimog, we were losing an hour a day in folding the sprayer boom and unfolding the sprayer boom. So that makes a big, 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 big difference. Liquid M35 liquid fert going in. This is the second dose on the ride at 75 kilos a hectare. I think. Without, without looking, I can't quite remember. We're doing fertiliser. Shut up, not too high. <laughs> so we've got about 19 things to settle. Which can get a bit tedious, but once you've uh, it's sort of second nature, once you've done it about 50 times. So you set your old steer, which all the fields are already mapped and plumbed in, so they're all already here. So your end sensor up. Got, um, 
whichever field's in there as well. And that's the crop. No, it's in, it's right. That'll be uh, a mistake on the stick. Winter right, growth stage, end content in 30 bars, uh, maximum rate, minimum rate, and the target rate of 75 kilos. That's ready to go when you press start. Then you have to go into this one. I'm about to forget something. It's 8,000 litre tank, 36 metres, triple fold. The soft propels double fold. For some, uh, some reason, that was how it ended up. It's obviously a horse. Like half the stuff we have. Um, it's uh, capable of automatic line switching. Carries 480 something different nozzles. Uh, it's got uh, four nozzles at 50 centimetres and then two nozzles at 25. So we can spray at 25 centimetres, which means you can spray lower. <laughs> I could go on forever. So that's it, ready to go. You press start on that. That should automatically start reading, which it is doing. So even the headlands are all steered. So we don't have to do anything really. You just sit here. end sensor as well today. Uh, the end sensor works in two different ways. When we're using it on a cereal crop, it works in what's called target mode. So target mode still, as an average of the field, will use the whole, the same amount we would do traditionally as a flat rate. So if we were going to apply 100, and, 100 kilos, say, as an average, uh, when we finish that field, even then target rate, it will still be 100 kilos of an average. But what it will do is it will work sort of either way. So it will wear, see areas in the field it thinks it wants to put more on, and it will see areas in the field it thinks it wants to put less on. So that's more of a traditional way the end sensors and variable rates been working for a long, long time. The exciting mode we have now in oilseed rape is absolute mode, uh, and that works purely, uh, purely uh, by itself, fully autonomously. So by that point, we drive into a field, we tell the, the um, end sensor what crop we're in, we tell the end sensor growth stage, few other settings, and then we drive into the field and that purely does its own thing. So we haven't got a clue nearly what it applies uh, until we come out the other end. And we've been doing that now for three years and since we've been doing it, had great results, a lot better yields, a uh, lot better um, sort of evenness of crop and we've been using less fertilizer, so a saving in fertilizer. Hopefully absolute mode will be here for cereal soon. It does exist, but as it stands at the moment, it, um, it doesn't quite right work properly. We've tried it the last couple of years and it doesn't, de it doesn't really put enough on. So we're hoping in the next year or two that, the, uh, that we'll be able to sort of use absolute mode across everything. And then that will be a game changer for us, uh, for, for a liquid fertilizer and for a fertilizer application on cereals. Yeah, it's a modern, uh, modern technology in farming. It's, uh, it's very good. I think the biggest thing is the accuracy and it makes you less fatigued as well. If you, uh, not so much with, well, it will be spraying as well, but certainly with drilling and things like that, you spend all day staring at a line. A, makes you more tired. You're not looking at what's going on behind you. Um, I think there's downsides to it. Like I, I mean, I had about five years before GPS came in. Um, but a lot of the younger generation won't ever probably have to steer a tractor themselves, which I think is ludicrous. We've actually had harvest students in the past that were doing a bit of subsoiling or something, and the GPS will pack up and they'll ring you up and say, I can't keep going because the GPS isn't working, which I think is stupid. But then it, it, do, and, uh, it makes you lazy as well, I think, because me myself, I've had it in the past where it'll pack up 
and you think, oh my god, I've got to stay for a bit. Because it does pack up. I think the biggest thing with uh, modern technology is it uh, it works very well, but it's like uh, it's like your phone or your computer. It, it's not flawless and it does crash. So you still have to know how to set it up and reset it and all the rest of it. Um, I think if so, well, I don't think I know. I mean, there's not saying the older generation wouldn't know how to work it, but if you've spent your life on a very uh, traditional, normal farm, my dad's a prime example, we're a little farm at home, and uh, my brother does uh, my brother does pretty much all the work, but every now and again my dad will get on the tractor, and he hasn't got a clue how you set anything up, he has to, he has to ring either me or my brother up to uh, how to start the tractor, how to even start the tractor sometimes, because it's... Um, Fence are a bit notoriously complicated anyway, but they're uh, younger people. It's it's the digital age, isn't it? And that's what everything is now. Whereas older people uh, have to do things mechanically. But it everything moves on, doesn't it? at an angle because there's a wet hole right across the field so you get in the wheeling so you can't get it out so I've got to do it at an angle there you it's, too, it's too wet shouldn't be going no controlled all. traffic today no no no, no, no. Not, this block here is about as much controlled traffic as driving across it making it look like a spider web this was uh, it was maize last year we foraged it, it was stupidly wet. And I had cultivated it and basically just ripped it up and left it all winter. And uh, we were hoping that we were going to get some frost and get back on it, but we never did. So, yeah, it's too wet, but it's been too wet for weeks, hasn't it? And it's not going to dry up anytime soon. And spring barley, the time's running out for it, so it's going, it's going in, kind of. Um, so we've had the little drill here as well, drilling some wet holes that are down here. What is the little drill? It's a Cavernaland TS Evo, but we like to call it the fire engine drill. Because when this great Starship Enter drill won't go, you go with that and it will pretty much go anyway. If you can, uh, if the tractor will travel, you can drill with it. Talking about tractors travelling. How's yours today? This is tra it's travelling very well. Yeah. No, the tractor's all right. Um, well, it's travelling all right. I've got a problem with my gearbox. I've only got odd gears for some reason. I can't get any even gears. I've got, I've got one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven. Then it goes into road, so it's twelve, thirteen. But normally you can press a button on the back and skip it down one gear and it won't let me do that. So I'm either killing it in ninth or you drop it into seventh. And it's revving its knackers off. Uh, but I can't get hold of it. I'm sorry either to find out if there's any easy way to sort it. And my decelerator stopped working. So, I don't know why, but we don't worry about these things. It's, um, Just quickly talk about how many horsepower per coulter you think it is. How many what? Horsepower per coulter. It's 10 horsepower coulter, I think. There's 40 on it. I can't quite remember. Yeah, it's massively over the top. It's 400 horse um, for a 6 metre time drop. But the little fence on the sprayer, and I don't want it to get dirty, so we thought we'd use it. 
That is, uh, yeah, it's what was in the aisle at the time, to be fair. You want a B series, don't you? No, no, we had a C. Cat engine? 18 litres of raw sexual power. <laughs> no, it was very good, very good. We had it four years and it broke down twice. Holy shit. I think we'll avoid that a bit. As I'm saying that, you won't go. Th you won't. Uh... <laughs> Left. Oh, problem. There. Bear with me. Pull that bit out. <laughs> yeah, as I was saying, a challenger won't go through that bit, would it? Whereas a contract, well, we kind of uh, we didn't really prove that then, did we? Was that moist or mildly moist? That was So my involvement on the farm's always been, I've, I've, I've been as keen as anyone ever could ever be for agriculture since, the, since I can remember really. Uh, any opportunity for me to be in and around tractors from the age I was, you know, any age I was allowed, I would be. Uh, I started doing my uh, full summers when I was 13, uh, driving tractors and then I would literally be on them every weekend I possibly could be. Between, between being at school and, uh, and um, anything else I was made to do at that point. Uh, I left school when I was 16 and decided I was gonna come back here on the farm. I did a, uh, did a modern apprenticeship based here on the farm, but then also out and about on other contractors and other farmers dotted around the place. Um, when I was 18, I did my basis uh, and various other qualifications, sort of base-wise working. Um, disappeared off to Australia, not particularly to go do any work, but to and have a look around and sort of live the dream. Uh, having returned back then, I returned back, again worked on a few a few other sort of farms and contractors dotted around, but then I've been back here full time really since about 2004, 2005 and carried on. So I, I'm not your standard, went to university, did a degree and then ended up back here. I sort of went straight in at the bottom end. When I first came back when I was 16, I was very much at the bottom of the pile. Uh, I, I was the, uh, the the one who was doing the sweeping up, the washing, the the all the awkward jobs. Very fortunate in the fact that Lorne and uh, my father were very good at sort of handing on their knowledge and passing on their knowledge. Uh, and then I sort of progressed, started doing more and more of the spraying, uh, more of the drilling, all of the cultivations, all the way through into the point where I really don't sit on that much agricultural machinery anymore. Uh, I do, which I miss. Um, but someone's got to sort of try and organize everything as well as they can. Uh, so back here on the farm today, we're two, two full-time people at the minute, Lorne and Matt. Um, we're in the process at the moment of interviewing for a third full-time person, AD dependent. Uh, and then we have another um, three or four students uh, in the summer. That might reduce and actually it's reduced, uh, uh, compared to three or four years ago, it's reduced quite considerably. We, we used to always uh, use a lot of, like as most farmers do, tractors and trailers on the roads. Uh, they were causing issues, legality problems for me, not being whiter than white. Uh, and I just wanted to be, always be seen to be doing everything properly and professionally. So we've now gone away from really not use, doing any haulage at all with tractors and trailers of our bulk crops. It's now all done by HGVs. Uh, we're fortunate enough for the fact that we have the, enough equipment to be able to to load HGVs, whether it's a forage crop or a, or a cereal crop. Um, we can cope with it at the grain store, most of the grain stores uh, dotted around the place. So it seemed a logical step for us to move totally HGV. What I love about HGV is the fact that as it stands at the moment, I don't, we don't run our own, but we have a very good farmer down the road who does have 
four or five lorries uh, and in the middle of summer we can turn them on and off so if we decide one day that we want two lorries he'll send two lorries if we decide the next day we only want one lorry he'll send one lorry and if it rains he'll send no lorries so we haven't got a lot of people sat around in the yard kicking their heels not look, we're looking for something to do in wet days we've got a core sort of workforce who are always busy but we don't have these excess students who um who traditionally have either been looking for a job in the summer have been looking for a job in sorry in the wet weather periods or uh or have caused issues because they're not being busy enough or being too busy the beauty of lorries again on top of that is they're 100 percent legal always petrifies me that actually as much as we're trying to be legal with tractors and trailers on the road particularly the new road regs i think if we drove into a back of a school bus we would uh get the book thrown at us and i would probably end up in prison whereas a uh, a, a lorry runs into a back of a um runs into a back of a school bus there's a whole paper train of trail of of where it's been tested when it was tested the driving hours um not only that they're a lot more efficient obviously they carry nearly twice as much they're t twice as quick um they i think they get a better perception from the general public the general public think they hate lorries but when you compare that to tractors and trailers i think they hate tractors and trailers more to give an example on that uh, when we first started doing ad crops we were harvesting uh, an ad crop next to the yard at florborough and it was the first sort of week we'd ever done it when we were using a mixture of tractors and trailers and lorries a lot more tractors and trailers and lorries and because we were short on numbers it was every conceivable tractor and trailer we could find not the best best or the highest quality or the or the, the perfect tractor and trailer for going down the road and our local villagers um decided that they weren't overly enamored by the amount of road movements and roaring tractors and trailers going past their houses and sort of complained but when i asked about how the lorries were in within the the ring of tractors and trailers they were well what lorries uh, and i said well there's two lorries running within the circle of tractors and trailers oh no i haven't even noticed those so that sort of made me think about it a bit and then all of a sudden um, the next day we had a lot of serious sludge delivered by seven trent similar tonnage to what we'd harvested that day uh, for the, in the rye crop um, where the locals had sort of got upset and the, exactly the same route same field seven trent delivered i think it was 2,000 tons of sewage sludge that day down the same route the next day the uh, carried on the, the day from after when we'd harvested the crops not one complaint so again i just thought well that seems to make sense really um so we moved to lorries for the total lorries uh last year full season so all of our all of our rye movements, all of our uh, cereal crops and all of our maize movements on the road, not everything, but nearly 99.9% .9 of them are done with a lorry. And we just don't have complaints anymore. They're, they're, the, the locals are happier. The lorries are a lot quieter. They can't drive up the curb. They can't, they're not driven by a young lad who's covered in flashing lights, flying down the road, upsetting everyone on his phone. Um, they're generally driven by more professional people. It's a sad way of looking at it, I suppose, but for me, I wanted to be a professional. I actually think lorries are going to become a big part of ag in the logistics side. So I just want to be able to, I want to be first, first at it, keen for trying to do everything legal, keep everyone happy. Again, I suppose what doesn't happen in our area is we don't grow, or hadn't traditionally grown many bulky crops because we've been, only been growing wheat and rape traditionally um, at 10 tonnes a hectare in wheat. That was as bulky as it gets. Whereas when we're now growing maize and, and a forage crop, or forage crops as a whole they're 45 50 tons a hectare so there's a lot more road movements locally so road movements with a 14 ton silage trailer compared to a 26 ton 27 ton walking floor lorry uh, you're soon halving them so it's the 4th of may it looks like outside that maybe spring has finally arrived we're due to hopefully start maize drilling today, probably a good two weeks behind schedule. Um, soil conditions uh, aren't brilliant. We've had some pretty poor seed beds from cold, wet soils. Um, we're having to move a lot of soil to try and dry them out. Dare I say, even use a power harrow, which here at Florida is pretty rare. Um, more down to our errors rather than sort of anyone else's errors. Anywhere we were having to use a power harrow, we're using it because the seed bed wasn't made or set up properly in the autumn. Um, we're also doing some lighter springtime cultivations which are on the better seed beds and then where we have got the seed beds a lot better we in the autumn we are, are doing no cultivation we'll go straight in with the maize drill so maize is late hopefully um, hopefully we'll get some heat and some temperature sort of in the next few months to try and play catch up spring barley drilling was eventually carried out on the 11th 
uh, it was again on, on a particularly wet block of soil or wet block of land. Um, conditions were far from ideal, um, but it was the case of sort of having to get on with it really. Um, covered in wet holes, but eventually drilled and eventually actually rolled and, and at the moment, other than probably needing a drink there, I say it's, it's actually looking pretty, pretty good. Um, as, as well as I suppose spring drilling or the spring barley being finished, we're also getting caught up on spraying. We're in the middle of T1s as we speak at the moment. T1s are going okay. Um, we have been making a bit of a mess in some tram lines. I think that's pretty a, pretty much a nationwide thing at the moment. We're having travelled early on in the in the spring or a late winter. Um, we've abused some tram lines, particularly in Orsi Drape. Uh, we can't do much a great deal about that. It's just a case of having to live with them now until harvest. Crops look pretty good. I mean, the wheat, considering how late drilled it was, uh, is, is, is looking well, really. Um, again, being late drilled, we've managed to um, not spend too much on fungicides. They've helped, uh, helped dramatically in sort of cutting costs. We've got pretty clean varieties, Skyfall, Illustrious, and Crusoe. So they're, for a, for a cleanliness point of view, they're pretty good in the first place. But because they're late drilled, fungicide spend will definitely be down. T1s, we, uh, we won't be doing any SDHI anywhere. Uh, where I'd say most of the majority of the country will be struggling with septoria and yellow rust, so therefore they will be doing quite a lot of SDHI at T1. So I'm perhaps saving 10, 20 pounds a hectare um, on that, which is which is great news really with commodity prices as they are. Um, oil seed rate looks good, really. Again, considering it's been trying to flower and these late frosts haven't done it any favours whatsoever, we're hoping again that the sun will sort of help with pod set and that will um, that that will really start flying. It needs to because it's obviously not that far away till we've got to think about combining it. So farming year so far, we've um, you know commodity prices are pretty poor at the moment. The industry as a whole is really struggling. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of lot of um, smaller farmers who are really going to be feeling the pinch. They must be because we certainly are. Uh, you know we're we're. We're not bouncing along the bottom, but we're certainly not making any real money. Um, but in, you know, hopefully, things will pick up. It doesn't look like at the moment they particularly will do. Um, doesn't help that we're getting lots of other pressures from from losing uh, or potential losing of pesticides. So glyphosate had a very close shave last month, where fortunately it's been approved for another seven years. Who knows what will happen in seven years' time? But it's something which we really need to think about looking after because farming without glyphosate in any system is going to be tricky uh, and it's an invaluable tool in the armoury really um, and I think it gets abused within the industry about how it gets used and how much, it, how much of it we use per season per crop and, and again maybe we're using it a bit close to, to the harvest interval or the harvest interval is not big enough should I say. Uh, I, I mean there's a whole plethora of chemicals we are looking like we're going to, to going to lose. Um, Chlormaquat, atrizoles, slug, uh, slug pellet point of view, obviously uh, metaldehyde's having a very hard time at the moment. Again, it's, that's gonna go. I think, uh, I think trizoles, if we lose uh, our trizole fungicides, that's gonna be a real, again, another, <laughs> another chink in the armor, really, for trying to grow a, a decent cereal crop here in the, in, in the UK. So we have the 1050 tractor or fence tractor on demo. It was a, uh, uh, it was the tractor which has been on the tour all the way around the UK. Uh, it's actually a prototype tractor really, rather than even the, a proper production machine. Um, we've been struggling with our quad track ever since we've had quad track really. Um, it, it, when it's going well in, uh, in, in wet, hard pulling conditions, there's nothing to touch it for power and traction. But the problem we have is we're struggling with reliability. Um, it's an expensive tractor to run, so uh, we were looking at our options and potentially the 1050 is a more of a versatile tractor. The big worry we have with the 1050 or had with the 1050 is the, f is the fact that are we going too far the other way. Um, it, we all know it's not going to be a, a, a replacement tractor for the quad track as in performance wise, but maybe it will tick the box. And I'm saying having tried it, it was, um, we were surprised how well it was working. Uh, Oh, we tried it on our Simba SLD, which we're trying to sell, but it's basically the biggest challenge you could throw at any tractor. And the quad track on the SLD on some on some wet, heavy stuff was uh, was pulling at about 120 litres an hour, doing about eight and a half k. Um, when we put the 1050 on the same machine, the same depth, we were probably doing a kilometre an hour slower, but we were using 
70 litres an hour. So again, a huge saving on diesel, uh, a lot more of a versatile track term potentially, so we can use it for on our ejector trailers for the maize crop. It can go and fetch and, and carry bowsers around if it needs to, just something a, a little bit more universal. The really important thing for me as well is the quad track's 29 tonnes, whether I like it or lump it. The only difference being is that if I don't fill it up with diesel. Um, the 1050 fully weighted is, is 22, 23 tonnes, so still a good five tonnes lighter than the quad track, but more importantly, we can take a lot of weight off it and it can weigh 13 tonnes. Um, weight's weight, and in, in when you're trying to look after your soils, particularly if you're drilling in wet conditions, even though the quad track's on huge, great big tracks, it's, uh, it's still a very heavy machine to be plodding around on, in, in wet soils. So I, I think the 1050 is maybe a better bet from that. And actually, it surprises all in its performance. It, it performed admirably, really. It's a lovely place to sit. It's um, very efficient. Um, we weren't allowed to get too carried away with it as it came with a, a minder or a demonstrator driver who was very strict with it. Uh, but it was a uh, it gave us a good opportunity to have a good go with it and yeah we were impressed really so watch this space it might be something which we potentially get involved with down the line So I'm here wiring in the drill into his Topcon X30 so we can do auto section and rate control on Isobus because uh, the fence screen can't yet do that. So fingers crossed we'll get the wiring right and we'll get somewhere. So uh, the main thing we're going to look at now is um, seed quality um, according to the disc. So uh, a Horsch Maestro you come with three discs as standard. We've got a 5mm, a 6mm and then a 6mm chamfered um, that come in the kit with the drill. We also do sugar beet and sunflower uh, discs for the, for the row units. Um, so what we'll do now, we've got a bag of seed uh, out of Tom's shed. Um, so we take the disc really, um, get the seed on top, of the, uh, on top of the disc and just feel to see if it falls through the actual disc. The worst thing you can have is actually the, the seed falling through the disc because that will stall the row unit up. Um, Another important thing to look at for the seed is, is the uniformity of size throughout the, the seeds. The worst thing you can have is small and big seeds because obviously that will give you problems with some seeds falling through, some seeds not getting on the disc. Um, so they're the, the, the three main things to look out for. So the 6mm, um, we now just have a look at that. This is the most commonly used disc um, on the actual row unit. Um, so you can see there it actually sits nice on there, just rests in the uh, groove on the actual disc. Um, so that's the preferred one to me. And then we look at the chamfered. <clears throat> the trouble you've got with the chamfered is I just think the seed's not big enough for the chamfered because then you get two seeds in there comfortably and they actually sit in there well. So I think the chamfered will give you double seeds and then we can also see with that seed it's dropping right the way through. Um, so that's, that's not going to be the disc for the job. So what we'll do is we'll go with the 6mm standard, um, so we'll just show fitting that to the row unit. Yeah. So what we'll do now is we'll fit the disc to the actual row unit, so you've got the uh, turn buckle screws and then the row unit just clips over the back. The disc then fits on the front of the uh, actual row unit or the motor side of the row unit, just fit that on there runs nice and smooth. There is shims in the back there to shim it up off the back if it's running too hard on there. Um, then in the back of the row unit, just to show you, we've got a baffle plate here, which is the amount of seed that's actually held on the back of the disc. That's adjustable for the different seed types like sugar beet, right the way through to different size of maize and what have you. Um, so that's the, the first setting that we'll check. So the standard setting is three, which it's set on. Um, and then the other setting we've got in the row unit is the variator which is this part here, which is adjustable by the top here, which what that does, obviously you can see it moves in or out according to what you want. So that will knock double seeds off, um, off the actual disc as it's running round. So the seed comes up round here and then drops down the actual row unit and into the ground. Two 
box in anyway, I think. What's the chances all the uh, everything's set the same, Martin? Right. Brilliant. So I've now got to open them all up to check they're all the same. We're just in the field now, just setting up the maestro. Um, you can see here we've uh, just cleared a bit of soil away so we can see the seed. So you can see the space and there's fair, looking fairly good with these three seeds. Put them in that position. It is, the drill has done that. Um, so yeah, the space is looking good. Tom's looking for around about a uh, inch and a half to two inches of seed in depth. You can see it's, it's quite cold this spring. Uh, this is the first really warm day we've had all spring really uh, and feeling the soil there it is quite cold so we just want to get it in into moisture and a little bit of depth but not too deep um, you can see here just to the left of the seed the fertilizer you can't really see it but it's just 33 mil deeper than the seed and to the left hand side um, you've got an option on the drill of the fertilizer depth so 33 is the standard setting, 55 mil is a deeper setting, and then we've also got the same depth as the seed in depth um, as an option, so three settings on that. Um, as we all know, maize is a lazy rooter, so that's really designed to get the, the maize to grow down to the fertilizer, to get it to put some legs down, get to moisture and what have you. Um, like I was saying about the soil, we can see here, it's, it's, it's nice and friable and tilthy on top, a lot of tilth there. But underneath, it, it's like plasticine, very heavy clay soils, like Tom will have explained to you previously. Um, it's uh, yeah, so it's quite uh, difficult conditions for the machine to work in. Um, also, quite uh, a rough seabed. But yeah, admittedly, we're on the headlands here, which isn't the best best place to be looking. But we'll have another bit of a look in the field, a um, bit more in-depth look in the field, and, and just sort of um, see what the accuracy is like there. Ready. Steady go. Maze drilling. It is the, I don't know what date it is. 6th of May. I think we're two weeks later starting than we were last year. So we're going to double shift it this year, run it 24 hours if we can, weather dependent. 
it's going quite well today, the sun's out, it's dry. I get to wear my vest top, which I quite enjoy. Yeah, it's all going, all going well at the minute. Doing a nice 14k at 98% accuracy, which anybody that's used a uh, precision drill knows the higher the accuracy the better. I've always been led to believe that any less than 96% is a bad thing. Because it's not like a normal drill, it just places the seed. I don't want to get a technical. I don't like technical. Uh, so yeah, hopefully uh, in shifting it, we should get quite a lot done. I don't think we'll uh, I don't think we'll get 200 acres in 24 hours done, but we might get close. We're predominantly a, uh, what's the best word to describe it? The soil's a bit turdy, it's heavy and manky, so we don't, uh, we don't get the luxury of lovely, fluffy, smooth seed beds like some of the boys do. So we struggle a bit with counter bounce, which makes things more difficult. But it's going okay. We have your auto steer set up on there. The drills worked through the fence screen, which works quite well. And it's all gravy, baby. I think we're, what have we got to do? We have got 1,500 acres of maize to drill. I think we've drilled about 150. Ish. I don't know without checking. We've got the other partner in crime coming on it tonight, Marcus. It's only his uh, third ever day on a maze drill, but he's he's doing all right, you know. To take him under my wing, giving him my expert guidance. That took about five minutes. Yeah. Having having a go and. Uh, Learning, learning the machine and all the little features and tweaks you can do to get a bit more output out of it. <coughs> but when it's going well and it's going nice like this, it's not. I say it's a nice job and it's a good job, but it is Friday night and it's quarter past six. So it is getting ready for the pub. But anybody who's a farmer knows when the sun's out and the weather's nice, you don't normally get to finish early or a day off. Watch any of this. 
Can you make the X30 make a better noise when the old steer activates? It sounds like a 1970s Amstrad. Just a little thing there. them shorts. I don't know, they're nearly as bad as yours. Are you on now? Uh, is this night four? Yeah, night three or four. I did one night where I sort of did three quarters of the day and then went home, had a couple of hours kip and went until like five the next morning to sort of get myself into it. And then mouth to do all that day and then I did that night and I've sort of been going like that way ever since. has a seat. <laughs> it's like having a pregnant person in your back. <laughs> yeah, no, so they tell me we're only about 200 hectares from getting it all done now, which is quite nice when we sort of only start on Wednesday. Do you think it's necessary to go through the night if you've only got so much to do, or...? In our situation, I think it probably is really because we're on probably as heavy land as you can grow maize on. So realistically, it means it should be in earlier to, you know, because we grow really early maturing maize, so it needs to be in as early as it possibly can be. So when you're late, it's sort of quite beneficial to get it in and get it done. And other things as well, you've got the tractor tied up on the drill when we've got a lot of spraying to do. And to spray us out and whatnot. So, it's only a short period of time getting through the night as well, it's not like it's months on end, is it?
we're going to go off and uh, we'll go and look at some spring barley, look at some maize, see how that's getting on after the wet weather. Hopefully the spring barley still stood up and then we'll uh, go and check some rye, which hopefully definitely should be still stood up. See how far we are off, um, off uh, yeah, off chopping. Go from there. We have on the farm. We have two agronomists who do uh, a lot of the field walking. I'm basis qualified, but I would struggle to be able to walk everything and try and do everything else at the same time, particularly when we're busy in the harvest periods. So we have two agronomists. One's been walking the vast amount of the farm for since before I've been here, really, uh, and then the other one's. Uh, relatively new on one contract farm but it's getting on seems to be getting on really well and they um yeah they send the wrecks through and we, we would talk about it first send the wrecks through and bob's your uncle they get then transferred into gatekeeper make the uh, make the the wreck up on gatekeeper um, we could have it so the the wreck went straight through from from the agronomist digitally and makes the wreck up itself and goes straight onto the sprayer's palms or the like, mobile gatekeeper web app the reason i don't do that is i like to check it make sure that I sort of am aware of what's going on, why it is and how it is, um, sort of keeping sort of taps on what's going on really rather than something being sent and me not realising uh, what's going on, where it's going on. So it's a good way of me sort of keeping keeping abreast of what's what should be happening and why it's happening. And I can amend it or change it if we feel like we need to. Is it quite good to get out and have a walk around the crops on your own and clear your head a little bit? Or? Yeah, it is, it is. I probably don't do as much as it as I ought to really, to be honest. Um, you're always trying to battle along doing something so you're either like with, with our AD stuff we're always I'm always trying to just make sure this is happening that's happening what's happening get abreast of legislation of what the government's releasing in tariff and you just don't yeah as we talked earlier about you losing your attention to detail and that's because your, your mind's so busy doing everything else and then my phone's ringing what was that what were we talking about Dave about like your attention to detail. Oh, attention to detail. Yeah, no, I'm, I, when you're always busy with your head full of everything else, it, I just losing your attention to detail happens, and yeah, it's bad. So um, we we need to get this AD thing either over or get over the line or pack it up because it's taking a lot of time and effort and mind um, to, to sort of get it sorted and compromise. Maybe particularly at the minute where we're trying to get it started and growing different crops and harvesting at many times of the year and late drilling and all the bits you do, which you know, it takes a lot of people and time. It just takes the edge off um, of sort of trying to get everything done 100% properly, which, you know, I think you've got to admit it if you think there's a problem. Uh, and you get it with scale, don't you, as well? You start doing scale, when you get into big scale, it causes you a bit of an issue. But So what's your next challenge going to be once you've got AD sorted? And we'll get, we're going to... AD, get, say AD, hopefully. AD happens as we hope it does. Um, We've then got to get our he get our heads around finding the crop and growing the crop, and I'm hoping we're going to be able to be sort of supply a lot of it in house. But equally, hopefully, we're going to have to source a lot from our neighbours. Uh, so that's going to take a bit of doing. Getting our heads around how we sort of do that, structure that, and then um, the machinery aspect of it, I suppose. Spending money, um, contemplate maybe moving to having a few lorries. I would guess down the line again. All, all pivoted on, on the big decision of whether it will or won't happen. So we're in the spring barley, which you saw being drilled earlier in the in the footage. It's a KWS Irena. It was drilled at about 450 seeds uh, on a block of land, which is 60 hectares down here, which is horrible and wet. Um, it's got quite a few drainage issues, so we've got to work on the drainage problems. But if I'm being honest, considering how we drilled it, the conditions we drilled it in, I was petrified that we'd mauled it in to the point where it won't make a crop and I think as you can see it's making a pretty fair crop so far I mean it, there's some poorer areas wet headlands um, again these areas wet holes where we know we've got these drainage issues so it's drilled on I think about the 10th of um, of April uh, for 450 seeds very wet going drilled with the big drill so it was placing 100 litres a hectare of 721 naught below it uh, just to give it a kick underneath um, We've, we've pre-emmed it, it would have been a, uh, a 0.3 of Liberator or some Stomp Aqua, just to sort of get, get it sort of um, cleared from a pre end point of view, weed point of view. And uh, it's great. I mean, spring barley from a black grass point of view is probably the crop. It's remarkably clean, um, no real issue. You can see we're just getting into bottle brush stage for the growth stage, so where the ears just sticking out. So we're not far off now from its next and final fungicide. 
So we'll give it a good dollop for that. It's had all its nitrogen, 160 kilos of nitrogen, including the stuff placed, um, which is sort of plenty. I f the wishful thinking is it will make quality, but to be honest, it will make feed. Uh, we, we might get some quality. We get too high nitrogen levels in the in the grain, so normally a two percent. I would hope. I mean, last year we had a we drilled um, grew spring barley last year for the first time in uh, 60 years nearly. And we had an amazing yield on everything last year. And spring barley last year did nearly nine tons a hectare. I think if we you know if we can do sevens, we'll be happy. Um, and we'll see. A lot depends on what happens now with the weather. Uh, hopefully it will stand up because it's spring barley is renowned for falling over. And fingers crossed, we'll be okay. Very clean for weeds. And from a black grass point of view. It's done a job, you can see. There's nothing sticking above the top yet. And if you look into the crop, very, 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 very little or any signs of black grass. There's actually one plant there, look, tiny little one. But he doesn't look particularly happy. Uh, there's only one of them. It's not tillered very much. And I would say by the time he wants to stick an ear out, if there's an ear there, it will be small to non-existent. Uh, and might even be sort of blank, white, a white ear. So yeah, no, from that point of view, pretty happy considering how it was drilled. It was as wet a conditions as you could drill with anything at that time of the year. As you can probably hear, we're right on the side of the A1, so it's a visual thing. It was a bit of a worry as well, if I was being honest. But actually, it looks good. We're happy. And um, yeah, fingers crossed for a decent crop. So, as mentioned, we've got some wet areas. This is an area very close to the A1 where I think we get a water issue running off the A1. Um, again, perfect sign of spring cropping on heavy land you know it, it, it's hard to get it perfect this spring's been a horrible spring we've seen a lot of wet holes show and sort of not disappear and this is a prime example of a wet hole so again the crop looks great but areas like this will reduce yield quite substantially I would guess because you're not cropping the full field at full bore but you know there's no point of pretending it all looks like the good stuff this is there's areas like that only a small area but there's a few of them are dotted around Little note in there to say it's a T1 
one scan. It's all ready to go. And the X30 has got feel fine, but being as we just have a quick cup of tea, we'll uh, reload him. is aimed at the target and nowhere else and that's, uh, that's always a good thing when we're being scrutinised by the general public. We have got to seem to be a very responsible thing. First, um, first crop of maize we drilled this season. It's had a pretty tough time as all the maize has um, so far. It was drilled, well, it started from the beginning. This was all cultivated in the autumn. So we cultivated it and didn't do anything to it in the spring. Generally this year, where we got our cultivations right in the autumn, we've not had to do any cultivations at all this spring. Um, we, it was, it was horse terrano a couple of times, twice. Uh, and then it's just been uh, it's just been drilled direct straight into this spring after having been sprayed off with glyphosate. Where we've had to use a power harrow or any form of um, heavy cultivation this year, we've got the spring crop we've got the spring crops um, seed bed set up in the autumn wrong, and then where we've done some light cultivations, we've got it half wrong. Um, you can see looking across it, there's the odd gap because we were very very dry after drilling and didn't have any rain until the deluge the other day, um, and then also we've as you can also see by looking at the leaves struggled with uh with slugs again slugs aren't meant to be a huge problem in maize but they generally have been this year and they've absolutely nailed a few plants they don't really seem to kill them they just seem to hold them back so uh drilled sort of the second of may i think roughly uh and then we've um uh, placed 150 kilos of dap below the seed it's mavana's the variety it's about a sort of 190 to 200 FAO, so the maturity class of about eight, as I guess. Um, some of the latest maize we will grow. We don't grow anything much later than this because of not wanting to harvest it in silhouette conditions. Um, as you'll notice, it's drilled at 50 centimetre spacing. So uh, most maize drillings dr drilled at 20, 75 centimetre spacings. This is drilled at 50 centimetre spacings, um, which means we get, we're giving each plant a bit more room to grow. It's 105,000 seeds a hectare, uh, and yeah, the establishment I would say is okay. It's not, it's not perfect, far from it, but it's it's okay. It's had a pre-em. It had a, um, it had just straight pendermethalin pre-em, and then we're due, and we would have been here early if we could have been, uh, to come and do some weed control. Um, there's a lot of wild oats in it in places. There's black grass with it in places, obviously. Um, the chemical we'll use for controlling black grass, we have a choice of either Maester or Callisto. Um, and uh, Maester is our choice for anything with a bit more black grass than it needs to be. It, it does a better job than what we can have in, in other crops. It's still not, certainly not a silver bullet and resistance will be an issue with it. But we, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's giving us slightly more options. It's due to be, we'll spray it soon. It'll then get topped up with the rest of its nitrogen to get us up to 150 kilos. And then beyond that, uh, it'll get some nutrients um, we'll probably use Yara Maze Boost. So that's basically every form of micronutrient possible. Uh, and yeah, just need some sunshine now. It's had the moisture, had the rain, got beaten the slugs now. Um, and it just wants, uh, just wants some heat to get it growing so we can chop it in September. Happy days. You can also hear the lapwings in the background, which is great news. Very rare farmland bird, which 
people say are disappearing, but we seem to have lots of them. So yeah, happy days. You can say you can see we we get this ridging effect where we've been drilling, um, and a lot of that is down to the fact because we are on very generally heavy clay soils, we get areas of those fields which cultivate nice and work nice generally for whatever reason. Um, and when you're drilling your maze, you sort of set your down pressure to be able to cope with and the depth to cope with those areas. And you get to an area where it's very hard, it needs more down pressure. So you set yourself to cope with those areas. But the problem is when that varies across a field, your down pressure varies. So where we get these humps and hollows or these ridges is where the, it's drilled relatively nice and it's chucked the seed out. And we'll get to areas where we've had poor establishment, where it's been harder, because where we've had the down pressure set to be able to try and comp to not have too much of this ridging, it then doesn't put the seed in enough. Uh, so the new horse drill, my understanding is the new horse drill for next year, they have an option now with variable down pressure. So as they're going along, it will alter the down pressure depending on how it feels that um, the ground conditions are, so whatever it needs. So, yeah, we'll see. We are actually stood in not the best part of the field. If I wanted to be a real show off, we could go right down there because that stuff will be like knee high and amazing. But this is in the this is in the, in the gateway, but it's um this is real life. This is real life, David. <sighs> One thing we could do it on, if you can find a good bit, is the auto shut off on the drill. Let's go and find a headland down here. See, one part of precision farming which I really like, and there's certain bits in precision farming which do wind me up, but one is something which when, which when it works well is great. As you can see along here, we drill the headlands first, and then the, the maze drill has auto shut off along each of its rows. So as the drills come into the headland here, or left the headland here, it shuts each row off takes a bit of fine tuning and we get occasionally get one which is a bit of a rogue but you can see there's nothing beyond the line this way so as we come across turns them off and it just stops the overlaps stops the amount of seed you're you know reduces the, the volume of overlap so it reduces the amount of seed you're wasting as such um yeah and it yeah makes me makes me feel happy because i like the look of it it looks it, you know looks impressive is that what you were setting up with the laptop at the beginning? Yeah, well, yeah, and when we and we're setting that up, and when we were here with Horsch with Martin, and we were digging away trying to work out whether we got it set right, so whether we were too far over the line or not enough over the line, and you do that for in and for out, um, and uh, yeah, I think we got it about bang on, by that rogue little thing over there, look. But uh, yeah, no, happy days. You do realise that I'm taking to my worst field of rye. That's fine. Keeping it real. You're gonna get your sneakers dirty here, though, Dave. Just for the critics, <laughs> is it? Yeah, people who think that we're just taking to the good stuff, and we get to get you a dry bit so you can get out. I don't want you to sink. Get a sink. I can swim. Yeah, but you'll get your sneakers. Those yellow sneakers wet. The problem is I'm not buoyant. <laughs> <laughs> Neither am I. Uh, yeah, yeah. Crop of hybrid right. I mean, it's I guess about ten days off harvest. We could probably whole crop it now. Um, and the dry matter not be too embarrassing. It sort of needs to be about, they, they, they hope for 37% dry matter, uh, but you start at sort of mid, mid 30s, early 30s. And it would be nearly be there now, but the, a lot of the yield comes out of the year and the, you, you do it at Milky Right, which there's a little bit in there. It's just green rather than being Milky Right. So another week, 10 days, probably 10 days, um, that will be at full yield potential. Actually, there's a crop of hybrid rye, this is near the yard, but it's quite small. If you look at that stuff there, that's that's probably more the average. Um, we this field is is a really bad field for black grass. We have at Florida a terrible field, down to a poor crop of oilseed rape we had in um, 2012, and we lost so much oilseed rape because of slugs in 2012 because it was so wet that any field which was half a crop we kept, and it was the worst decision we could have made because the black it allowed because they were because it was patchy it allowed the black grass to grow, um, and we should have just sprayed it off and did something else so this was really bad so the following wheat crop was a shocker like you see basically everywhere this the sort of around the country at the moment but this was three four four years ago so we were sort of hit that problem in here before before it was deemed to be a, a problem nationwide so we um, what have we done in here then we followed that wheat crop with a maize uh which was uh, did a corking job you all did well and we had pretty good control on the bottom of it because it was so late late planted we've then followed that crop with spring barley which if we look is down here in the bottom like that so there's still some volunteers about and then we followed the spring barley with a hybrid rye the hybrid rye didn't have a great start in life because we hadn't really got the seed bed perfect and when we drilled it it was a bit wet so it was a bit the establishment was okay but it was wasn't as good as most um 
And then what didn't help in the winter, particularly the far end of this field, is it flooded, the river came over because of the weather. And we've sort of struggled with that. We've battled away really with it being wet and it's now wet again from the rain we had the other day. This farm here, this part of the farm here had 130 mils uh, of rain in four or five days. So it's, it's really, really wet. So the rye sort of is slightly smaller than it needs to be. It's still not a bad crop. It'll still do away. It should hopefully do over budget quite happily. Um, but we, we would hope that we've got crops which nearly all look like that and you wouldn't be able to see me in it really. Um, it's a, I think it's Magnifico as the variety. It would have been drilled the first week of October um, and generally all it's had is a, from a chemical control uh, spray or chemical control point of view is had a, uh, a, a Liberator Stomp Aqua um, uh, pre-em and that is it for wheat blackgrass control. There's, there's the odd blackgrass plant in it but not much at all really considering the pressure of the pressure of the field and actually for a cup of rye which is meant to be a lot thicker than that normally it would compete against that. I'm sure the spring barley in the bottom has probably actually helped quite a bit to be honest. Um, so it's had a, that's what it's had from a blackgrass control, it's then had uh, a tabaconazole for, for an, as an early fungicide timing, lots of growth reg, we wouldn't have growth reg this field as much as we will have elsewhere because of the, because of the fact that it was a bit dodgy establishment. Um, and, then, uh, and then it's just been topped up, we get a lot of brown rust, we can get quite a lot of brown rust in, um, in these varieties, you can see some old dead stuff there. Um, which so we've had to go back through it and do some um, some profile just to sort of uh, keep on top of it uh, and yeah we're, we're here for harvest it's 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 getting ready not quite ready yet but won't be far off so what's your plans between now and right after harvesting it to then drilling it because obviously yeah. it's a big window yeah no, there is one the, the big question is what we put in next if we were hoping we would normally put oil seed rape in after i because it gives us an early in entry so we harvest it early early end of june early july sorry and then we would normally leave it and then we would do a bit of repairing where like, the mouse had been and then the trailers had run heavily on headlands subsoiling wise and then we would leave it. I've got a slight worry in here because I don't think, well, we'll dig some holes after we've sort of harvested it, but I'm not 100% sure that A, I want to put an all seed rape in here yet because of my black grass point of view and B is I want to do some cultivations I think, particularly that far end where it flooded because it's sat wet, we've got some horrible tram lines down there. Um, but the problem come, again comes if I do a lot of cultivations, I definitely don't want to put rape in because that just makes the blackgrass grow everywhere and different depths and the weed control and the rape will be atrocious. So maybe we might even follow it with maybe even a winter barley or something uh, or maybe a spring barley, go back into the spring again. Um, we'll, we'll see. But it's, I'm, I'm amazed from, from, from that wheat crop, which was atrocious for blackgrass, compared to where we are now. I mean, the previous crops, the spring barley did a great job for blackgrass. The maize did a great job for blackgrass. There's a surprisingly less level, particularly at this end, there'll be more at that end of black grass in a relatively average crop of rye. So we'll be, um, it'll be interesting to see sort of what black grass we think is there. We'll, we'll be able to tell when we come to harvest, we'll sit, look in the stubbles and see what's, see what's about. But I would hope, um, yeah, that we'll probably not put rape in it and we'll go back to another crop, maybe a winter crop, and, um, and go from there. Okay, look, Dave, I found you a black grass. There is the only one in the field, look. You're proud. I, I'm pretty confident it won't be the only one in the field. There's not much though. Um, so, so the, is this how AD helps you being able to? Yeah, because the, that's, what, that's a good point, really, isn't it? I mean, that black grass there, rye as a whole is is a bit like the hybrid winter barley. It, it competes with the black grass, so you'll still get black grass in it because you're still drilling it as an autumn crop. But what it does do, it competes. So because it competes, you get a very average one single head off of one black grass plant. And actually, sometimes what you also get is you get like a an area in, on the ear like that where um, where there's nothing because it's just it just doesn't like this competition point um so rye harvest is is not far away at all really i think actually if we haven't had this rain and it stayed dry it would be next week uh, but it's probably going to be 10 days away um we need to go and have a sort of look see where we are for dry matters and bits and bobs uh potential the crop looks relatively good i think it looks quite good we had some brown rust in late which we had to control it another spray in some varieties which was a bit of a shock an extra late um spray to control brown rust because of where we are, the state of AD, we've not, we don't own a forage harvester, so we, we rent one. And having, um, having sort of gone round the houses 
and tried nearly everything since. One thing we haven't tried properly is a is a Chrome. Uh, the I seem to look, feel like I get on quite well with the Chrome boys, having only really met them sort of in the last six months. But they sort of feel like they're going to be able to look after us. New dealers, dealers quite far away. So the only way you find out is by trying one. So we've rather than having a demo for half an hour, we thought we'd have a Chrome for the for the season. So we've got a a 700 Chrome coming. Um, typical floor brush spec, slightly different to normal. It needs side knives on the hold crop header to be able to cut through the vetch rye, which they've never done before. So they're at the moment working hard to get that here in the next 10 days for us to start. Hopefully, if Crone can get themselves organised, we're also going to have a Crone silage trailer. So they're one of their big, like our big Larrington ejectors, it's one of their big silage trailers. It doesn't actually eject, but it's quite lightweight and quite big. If we were to buy one actually down the line, we would probably buy a bigger one because it's we won't, this one won't quite fill a lorry, but it's better than a standard silage trailer, and it also doesn't tip up in the mouse, which is what we want. We want a, an ejector or a uh, moving floor and loading trailer. So again, the Chrome boys have managed to find one of those. I think they're quite keen for that to be here, and we're very keen to have it. Uh, fingers crossed. Be good for the video. Uh, oh, you rolled your eyes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, yeah, no, we're we're getting there. Marcus is um, Mark Marcus is is here now. Marcus uh, has done a bits and bobs foraging before, but he's really been dropped into it. So he's going to be on the forager and then on the combine. So he's got a very busy four months coming up. Uh, he's excited about it. I think I think he was keen for a crown. Um, is it your choice to get a smaller crown because it's not? The usual floor tradition. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I'm, I, I think to be honest, the big crone. I think we would struggle to cope with. To be honest, having, having seen one worker uh, in Lincolnshire in the in May's last year when the mouse went across there, uh, I think they're nearly un for what we're trying to do. The bottleneck of the mouse. I think we would struggle, and we don't need one that big. I don't think anyone really needs one that big. To be honest, but you know, big is beautiful. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's not yeah, it's not an eleven hundred. I don't think we would cope with eleven hundred. I don't think we have the workload for an eleven hundred. Um, and I, we'll see. We'll see what a seven hundred is like. Really, maybe it's bought. You know, it'll be about the right size. X has a unique crop flow system. Six massive pre-compression rollers with uniformly high pre-compression ensure an excellent chop quality. Operating at extremely uniform speeds, the massive enclosed Krona chopping drums give consistent cuts because there is always at least one blade in mesh with the counterblade. All components are perfectly matched and tuned to each other. 660 millimeter diameter, 800 millimeter width, 
The enclosed chopping drums are especially designed to match the engine rating of the Big X 600, 700, 770, 850 and 1100. I about to say, well, I was trying to work it out. Day two. Uh, day two. Day two of rye harvest, or day two of harvest at the floor breath. We're, um, we're across in the Vale, harvesting hybrid rye. Uh, we are, the date today is the 5th of July, so we're slightly later than we would normally be. Um, but with ground conditions being as it was, and the weather being as it was, it's been pretty, um, well, it's been quite good that we're slightly later than we normally to be, um, because we would have been traveling. We, the, before we started uh, yesterday, the trailers and the mouse had been out, helping out another contractor who actually had some fields not too far away which were unpassable with normal trailers uh, and so we went in there as a fire engine really to help him harvest his uh, ho uh, ho uh, barley, yeah, whole crop barley for um, the goats. Not AD? Not AD, it's not all just about AD. No? No, 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 as much as people think that's all we think about. But is that no, a myth? It is just a myth, it's not all about AD. So, so yeah, so we're in a field of hybrid, uh, hybrid um, rye. Uh, as you can see, we're getting to the point now where it's ready. Well, you can't see you're all the way over there, but it's now at the uh, cheesy ripe stage. So if I do that, delicious. Um, so that's there. Um, dry matter test says it's about 36, which is 37 is where it gets adjusted to, but we don't want to be too late. That's end up with a clamp full of trampoline. There was someone 28 today. Was it, yeah? Yeah. No, fuck that. No, we're, th we're, th we're th this is about 36. It's bang on, right, ready? Um, we hope to yield about 40 tonnes a hectare adjusted weight, and I think we are about doing that. We're certainly not as good as we were last year. Um, the crops aren't as tall as a whole. I mean, this one's not a bad crop, nice and thick in there, but not as, you know, it's been heavily growth regged. Um, and yeah, so it's yielding all right. We're traveling better and better every day because the sun's out. We, haven't, we had a shower of rain this morning, which was a pain because we put the mouse in one place and then had to move it um, onto the side of the road, then move it again two hours later. Uh, I mean, it's pretty clean, a little bit of brown rust in it. The old blackgrass plant that you can see there, that's exactly what rye does to it. Uh, it's a sort of stop the, the top of the head from producing out. Uh, and then, is it falling off? Ish. So we're, we're going to drop some on the floor, but as a general rule, we're not going to drop that much. I suppose the big question is, did you buy it, rent it or loan it? We, um, what did we do? We uh, rent it. Yeah, we rent it on a good loan deal. Uh, yeah, that was the uh, question yesterday. Yeah, quite a lot of people have realised or noticed um, from social media that we a seem color green. have a different colour green in the camp. Um, and why is that? Uh, main reason being that we just fancy trying all of the manufacturers. We've we had a Fent last year, Class as well, obviously, uh, and then we're trying a Crone this year. Uh, and the main reasons for that is to just see what they're like, gives us a good opportunity rather than just having it on demo. We just try it for a season. Um, Crone looking after us, it's going very well actually. I mean, we're only two days in, but it seems to go very, very well. The head is great. That's one real big thing we've noticed. The whole crop header is by far the best one out of the three. Um, and the machine's just cruising along quite nicely. We're filling her up and yeah, going well. So, so far, so good. Um, so, second day of ride today. Uh, I would hope in sort of 11 days time we will be finished, probably more like hopefully 10 days. Um, fingers crossed, we just need some, a good weather window to stay here with us, we don't want any showers, which looks like at the minute we're all right. Um, but yeah, we need some temperature, my word do need some temperature. All the other crops need some temperature, maize particularly, maize look, it's going to be a very, very average year for maize I think. Looking pretty sad. It looks rubbish, yeah, it looks rubbish. We've got some stuff which is quite good but then we've got some stuff which is appalling. How is your green driver? He's good, I right? yeah I mean uh, I'm overly overly impressed really first time he's ever driven a chopper in, in anger and uh, we stuck him on it and I think everyone's commented how good he's done really he's done a good job um, yeah most of it goes in the trailer and everything so I can't whinge. No he has no to be fair to him he's done a good job good job but I think he's enjoying it uh, whether he'll be enjoying it in 10 days time or in maze. Or in maze, after he's been sat on the combine in between, I don't know. But uh, yeah, no, he's enjoying it. He's, um, he's happy. Uh, he's happy. I'm happy. Farmer's happy. I've got shorts on. You've got shorts on. And sneakers? No, no still no. toe cap boots. Still toe cap boots. Uh, the sneakers got dirty this morning at an AD site. <laughs> yeah. 
but it's not all about AD Dave. Um, Sorry. Uh, and uh, yeah, so there we can't complain. Can't complain. So fingers crossed. Let's hope that yields stay where they are. I think it's rye's always a great sign for what stuff's going to yield, as in normal combinables. So if rye has a good year, wheat will have a good year. Rye's having an average year, budget year. So wheat will probably be similar, I would imagine. There's not enough sunshine. And as it comes over the hill. Whirring away, keeping your neighbours awake. Whirring away, keeping the neighbours away. We had a slight problem that some family who, where the AD, little AD plant here is on this contract farm, we have to drive past some houses which are on within the farm as a ring fence and they've got a, uh, they've got a uh, cattery and we were getting dusty pussies yesterday. Which... How did you cope with that? <laughs> I don't know, well the chat, uh, the farmer said we had to go in and dust them, so... I've not had the Is that call. in part of your contract? I haven't, I, haven't had the, I haven't had the call yet to dust the pussy, for sure. Um, Is that yeah. the 20, 20 mile an hour, 15 mile an hour, 10 mile an hour, 5 mile an hour? That bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, we, I've, I've built a dust suppression machine today, because it's the dust which causes the problem. Would you get a Dyson? No, no, she, the Unimog's got a bit of heavily modified bit of pipe on the back. She's beautiful. I mean, you better open the tap and let the water pour out. Yeah, and go down the track. Happy days. Down on the fen today, it's a 60 hectare block of hybrid rye, probably the best we've harvested so far. Um, maybe drilled a tad shallow on the headlands, so they're sort of letting the field averages down, but through most of the field we're sort of averaging between 50 and 55 tonnes a hectare, which is by far and away the best crop we've been in so far. Um, Laurie's keeping up comfortably with the mouse and I'm keeping up. So I had my biggest day yesterday. Did 37 hectares for just over 1,500 tonnes, which is my best day so far. So yeah, it's going well. Yeah, first time I've driven the chopper. Um, absolutely loving it. It's quite a simple machine to operate and touch wood. She's been very reliable and delivering us a good clean cut about my only gripe would be with the controlled traffic and cutting a dead six meters when you're in crops like these that are slightly late see there when it's when it's going the wrong way because it's so tight with the header width you uh, you get the odd wisp left but other than that i think it looks like it's doing a cracking job so yeah you can't complain at all how are you trailer boys trailer boys are getting there no bloody good Bloody good, can't complain at all. Keeping up nicely. I don't know, I better go and do something. It's, it's not a bad job really. It's 
quite good fun. It's nice to set yourself goals to try and get these wagons and when you get so many done a day, it's quite nice. Just a pain. Hold up a minute, Randy. Yeah, it's just a pain when you don't quite hit it, but it, it's just that it's all machinery breaks a bit, doesn't it? But this just seems to have a habit of it at the moment. I don't know whether she's just a bit tired or what, but so we're just running her a little rather than running her today to fill up wagons as fast as we can, we're just running her to keep up with the chopper. We don't really need to go any faster than the chopper because we're going any faster and she's sat still doing the thing so but, uh, it must nearly be full surely. Yeah. 